Hey everybody, this is uh, Robbie Puzzatello with Rick and Rob Radio Rockstars here on BlackSquirrelRadio.com and today we have a special interview with Jeff Smith. He's a uh, comic book illustrator and author. He did a very popular series called Bone and he also works on Razzle and some other cool stuff. Uh, Jeff, how are you today? I'm doing great, Robbie. Good to talk to you. Yeah, it's uh, you know good to get the opportunity to chat here. So, um, yeah, I guess I sort of want to just start off with... Um, uh, I'd like to know uh, where you began writing and drawing in general, you know, like where it all really started. Uh, I, well, I always loved comics. Uh, from the time I was very young, I was a, a big fan of the Sunday comics section. Even before I could read, my dad would read them to me. Uh-huh. Uh, and I was also um, really in love with, like, the Donald Duck Uncle Scrooge comics that were done by Carl Barks. Mm-hmm. Of course, back when I was a kid... You know, he wasn't allowed to sign the books. They were just like by Walt Disney. So no, no one knew who this good duck artist was. But uh, <laughs> but whenever his his uh, comics would show up, you go, that's the guy. That's the good comics because he really he could really make a move. And uh, the the other big thing that really blew my mind was Mad Magazine. I was a huge Mad Magazine fan. Okay. So. Um, so that kind of that kind of is what drew me into the world of comics because that that's where I could see reality. That's where I saw, that's where I saw what was really going on. Especially with Mad Magazine, they were always telling you what the grown ups were really up to. Mm-hmm. How they were trying to screw each other and sucker each other into buying, you know, dandruff shampoo or a new car or mm-hmm. soap suds or whatever. Yeah, and that almost seems reflected just because. Uh you know, like the stuff that you've done is more independent, not like Marvel or DC characters. And also I feel like, uh, like the bone boys have, um, you know, uh, sort of like a Disney cartoon character quality to them, you know? Well, yeah, sure. Well, well, like I said, I, I, one of my favorite comics was, uh, the uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck comics. Yeah. Uh, and of course when I was younger too, I, I was a huge fan of Disney movies. Uh, I think, uh, the Jungle Book came out when I was like seven years old or something, and I just uh, that was like my favorite thing for a uh-huh. long time. So I do love the aesthetic and the construction that's in the, those kind of drawings. Right. But when you read Bone, it kind of subverts the whole idea of the you know happy fairy tale world that you usually see in Disney movies. Yeah, it's more of like a. I've I've compared it to like Lord of the Rings when I explain it to people, you know, because yeah, and it, it does have a it, it, well, heck, I mean, I have to I have to admit it. I mean, Bone practically bleeds the Lord of the Rings. I, I it was <laughs> it was one of my favorite books, uh, but again, it also kind of sub- subverts it. It's 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 like taking the Lord of the Rings and throwing the Marx Brothers into it. You know, that's what the, that's what the right. they kind of tear everything down, everything that uh, is so important to everybody else. Yeah, and they're. Uh, they're very comical and stuff too. I mean, it, it's uh, it's an interesting, you know, juxtaposition of you know just the cartoony culture, but you know, a very grand story. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've heard that you uh, were like you worked for I think it was Ohio State's press or whatever, and doing the comics. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, so what did you do there exactly? Well, there was a student newspaper. I, uh-huh. It's still there. I don't know what the circulation is anymore, but it was about 40,000 every uh-huh. day. Wow. It, was like a, it was called The Lantern. It was a daily paper. And they uh, they ran comics in it sometimes, you know. Like, And I thought, well, you know, this would be a good way to practice, you know, drawing co- comics. So I took a you know a couple weeks' worth of strips. They were kind of nascent versions of Bone, you know. They were, they were gag a day, but they were all in a fantasy setting and had these three Marx Brother types characters going around <laughs> causing havoc. Yeah. And um and uh it, it did pretty well. It ran every day in the lantern for like three, four years, I think. Wow, that's the whole re- time I was there. Yeah, and how did that start transitioning into uh like a full feature comic book that uh, you know, inevitably got picked up by like Scholastic and stuff? Uh, well, I'll see if I can make that into a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the, the first part of the short answer is that I tried to sell the strip as it stood. Oh, really? The bone of that, that kind of daily strip thing. Yeah, too, sort of like a syndicate. Calvin and Hobbes kind of thing. Yeah, in fact, I was shopping it around at the exact same time with Calvin and, uh, that Bill Watterson was shopping, shopping oh. Calvin and Hobbes around. Okay. And they were telling me, oh, well, we're not really interested because we're looking for, you know, a strip about kids. So right. Bill, Bill was right in the door on that one. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so after getting rejection slips from every single 
newspaper syndicate, every feature syndicate. Um, I had almost given up on doing Bone um, when I happened to wander into uh, the University Bookstore and I picked up a copy of Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which had just come out. Yeah. The, where the you know the story about the Holocaust, where mm-hmm. the, the Jews are cats and the, yeah. the Jews are mice and the Nazis are cats. Yeah, another very renowned. Oh yeah, title. Bro- brilliant book, brilliant book. Uh-huh. But that is when I started to think, oh wait a minute. The, I only thought of comic books as just you know Spider Man and Archie, you know, and uh-huh. all of a sudden this was a book. Yes, this was you know uh, long form comics storytelling, and it was you know, and, and if you've read it, you know that it's. It's genius. So I was like, this is a form that, um, th- you know, probably if I wanted to do like a real, a real epic story, a real long form story, like I wanted to do with Bone, you know, have him go on a real adventure with consequences mm-hmm. that had a beginning and a middle and an end, you know, yeah. 1100 page tale. I, I could do it in this medium. And it was Mouse that uh, really turned the light on there for me. Cool, very cool, and the, and so um, I mean, it did come out in in issues originally, though, right? Yes, it did. It, it was in uh, Raw magazine, which was a huge oversized thing. It was sort of like that Interview magazine. I mean, it was uh-huh. it was large, and it was generally only available on newsstands in New York City, uh, yeah. at least originally. But it was a pretty shocking, groundbreaking magazine, and Mouse was serialized in it, sort of like a smaller comic book size things stapled in the middle of it. Uh, and those of us who were, you know, that was the first book of Mouse was only the first half and it continued. And those of us who were kind of like in the know, you know, if we lived in Ohio, had mm-hmm. to work pretty hard to like track down these other issues of, uh, of raw magazine. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And it's, um, and it's so, sort of appropriate because I mean, bone really is like an indie success story, you know, that it, uh, you know, like it just kind of came out of something very small, but now, I mean, you know, you've, you've had the opportunity to write, you know, Shazam and, uh, characters like that. So it's kind of like they came to you for that afterward. Right. Yeah. 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 So, and then, I mean, had you always had, uh, I mean like the bone, um, storyline in mind or did you suddenly just dis- like, cause you said they lived in a fantasy world, but did like, or did you start developing, you know, the deeper complexities of, you know, I mean, like grandma Ben and, you know, the whole backstory and, and secrets. And yeah. That. Like where did all that start? Well, um, the, the comic strip that I did, uh, for the lantern at, at OSU, uh, uh-huh. I had all the characters there, and I uh, and I had a lot of fun with them, and they were really the bones were, were great foils for, you know, all these other different. Yeah, characters. I'm sure it's very humorous. <laughs> well, I wasn't that good at it back then. They're, oh. pretty, they're pretty awful, but oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but basically it was it was funny. Um, a lot of slapstick, a lot of verbal puns, <laughs> but uh, but once I started trying to figure out how to. Um, tell a story, I began to realize that the comic strip didn't have much, um, you know, there's, well, let me try a different way of explaining that. Okay. There are, there's a couple of ways you can structure a story, right? One, and the main one is just, just laterally, you know, horizontally make a line. There's a beginning and a middle and an end, and you have, mm-hmm. you have a story that has a conclusion. But there's also a vertical axis, you know, where the story has some depth and some meaning. And I f- just didn't have any of that in the original strip. It was just meant to be a gag a day with no ending. And as I began to create an ending and 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 really, you know, sit down and work on a what the story would be, I began to look for this other axis of depth, you know, and and that's where you start building in backstories. You start um, building in history for the world that yeah. you want the characters to live in. Um, and, you know, setting up traps and consequences and also s- using symbolism um, yeah. Like water is a is a very age old uh, storytelling device that you know once you start bringing water into the story it triggers something in readers' imaginations or almost in their subconscious that you know oh, oh something uh, something weird and fantastic is about to happen. Okay. For for example, um, in King Arthur stories you know they'd be going through the middle of a deep dark woods and come across a fountain surrounded by virgins right 
you know something good's going to happen, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's cool. I mean, um, yeah, I feel that with a lot of people, just uh, you know, they kind of know. Or, well, I mean, you could either have your I, your story idea and then develop the characters, or you can have your characters and develop the story around it. You know. Yeah. Um, I found also that the process of of doing the comic, you know, over thirteen years, yeah, the story grows and the characters kind of help build the story. And you know, sometimes it's not even stuff that um, that me as the author am consciously trying to do, but the characters will just sort of start molding the story around them uh you know and, and opportunities open up and uh-huh. so, so things really grow and, and as much as i tried to plan it all out there was huge amounts of um improvisation and and fun things that just opened themselves up uh to explore yeah how did you know like where to end it well i, I figured out the ending first uh-huh. in, in part of this in part of this process of going from a university newspaper strip to um a comic book, I knew that the the long term plan was to have a, a finished book that would be, you know, a, a, a substantial size, you know, the biggest War and Peace or something or the yeah. Odyssey. Um, so I, I I came up with an ending first. I mean, mm-hmm. I kind of thought the story out. I got I go that's it. I got the ending. I know. Right. I know what the goal is, I know how they're going to accomplish it, and I know what's going to happen to all the characters. And then I kind of did this process of kind of writing it backwards before I even started, you know, and filling in certain mileposts, so to speak. You know, yeah. these, are, these are the three pillars of the story, and I've got to hit these at certain junctures. You know, about every two years I would get to one of those junctures, and I knew, you know, I was building toward it, and I'd hit it, and bam, okay, off to the next one. And sometimes the characters would... Uh, some silly piece of business, like they might run into some giant bumblebees or something, and it's just <laughs> yeah. it's just silly, and then you know, everybody's getting stung by bees and they're hitting each other, and mm-hmm. uh, but it will it'll spin off into a, a very funny story that miraculously becomes part of the overall fabric, and you know you just kind of follow that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's uh, I don't know, like just overall, it's a very charming read um you know i remember my my buddy sean always had them on his bookshelf and i for years i would like just as a kid i'd like i'd see them and i you know i, I remember like the great cow race always stood out to me as a title and i was just like what is this book about and i finally <laughs> read it and like that's where the door opened uh for me reading comic books that fateful day but um fantastic and so yeah i mean uh I know that there's been some, you know, trial and error with getting a, a movie off the ground, but I hear that that's kind of actually starting to come into light. I mean, uh, do you know much about it? Or yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I know quite a bit about it, but uh, <laughs> it's it's a it's a different business than comic books. I mean, in comic books, you know, my wife and I, who's my business partner, you know, we we call all the shots. We we plot out how things are going to hit the public. You know, when things are going to happen what we're going to do yes with hollywood this is you know that's an entirely different industry so yeah uh (laughs) you know i'm definitely i don't really know exactly what's going on so i i just want to clarify my remark there Uh um but yeah but looks things are looking pretty good i've i've Mm -hmm. finally seen a script there i mean that looks like bone uh up until now oh the script is uh it's like it's um it's kind of ready, or oh yeah, yeah. They did a yeah. They did a. I, they read did the first draft of the script, or they might have done two drafts of the script. So over like the last seven months, you know, they've been showing me the script, and everybody's involved. But there's a lot of uh, there's a director involved, and there's producers oh, cool. at the studio, and there's um, Animal Logic is the they're the animation studio in Australia that did Happy Feet. Oh, okay. And, and they're producing the movie. So uh, we're all been, like, for the last seven months, been all, you know, working over this script that some poor guy has been <laughs> <laughs> writing and getting all these notes from. But yeah. uh, it, it uh, finally seems like a, a pretty decent script. And, uh, yeah, and I, the studio's now um, moved it up the ladder to the next step. So I, the director's now giving the script another polish. And we'll see where we go from there. Okay, yeah, because I've heard, uh, you know, that Warner Brothers, who... It's Warner Brothers that's putting it out, correct? Right. Yeah, I was I was actually I was pretty happy to hear that just because um I actually went out 
to California over the summer and I got to see, you know, their studio and stuff. And I don't know, they're, they're sort of a company I'm always rooting for, you know, I think they put out some good stuff. So, yeah, I have um, a lot of, uh, I'm with you on that. I mean, going back to the Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck type cartoons, the yeah. these cartoons, I have a lot of affection for the Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. But, um, so, and then they came to you with, uh, you know, I heard, or well, like from what I've read that there, there was like a four minute clip that was like how the movie would look and everything. And yeah. I mean, it sounds, or is it like a, did they show you like a scene from it or did they just kind of like make No, something? I think, um, what you read, I'm sure is, I've, I've seen the, it's been written about it. It's, it's pretty accurate. It was about a four minute bit that they just took. I think the the producers of Happy Feet just decided they wanted to do this to help kind of move, get it moved again. It has, was stalling out a little bit at the studio. Yeah. And they just on their own grabbed like, I don't know, they picked a few bits of dialogue straight from the comic and they just hired some temporary voices to act it out. Uh-huh. And it's, it is basically phone bone and phony bone walking around in the desert yeah. with a map saying lines from the comic. And they, the, t- <laughs> the timing was good. Uh, and and it was in 3D, dude. I mean, they took my wife and I, Vijay, into this little conference room with a 3D TV and put us put the glasses on us, turn the lights out. Didn't really warn us what we were about to see because they wanted to, <laughs> they wanted to surprise us, and boy, they did. It was fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure that you know, seeing these characters that you've spent so much time with, and um, because I heard that they're very close to your drawings, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm this, sh- uh, they still are at this point. You know, like I said, it's it's a different business. It's, but, yeah. Uh, at this point, what they're showing me it looks just like the drawings. Cool. And the, and do you have? Um, I mean, what what like are you part of the movie in any aspects? Or? Well, sort of. I mean, you know, I'm I'm the executive producer, but you know, that's I don't have any special entitled role i mean i just okay. i put my advice in just like everybody else and right sometimes they take it sometimes they don't yeah and it'll be it's being narrowed into a trilogy i hear well who, i don't know oh, okay they're they're making one movie right now they take elements from all over you know they're doing it like a you know they're doing an adaptation right which is fine with me the comic's a comic yeah it yeah it'll be cool to see it i mean um it's certainly a story that deserves to be out there, you know, and I mean, it already is, but I mean, yeah, the, the way co- I look at it, it'll be, it'll be fun to go to the premiere and uh, hopefully people uh, will buy a lot more bone comics. from. Yeah. It. That's a, yeah, that's a good <laughs> mindset. <laughs> I mean, you know, just see, um, I mean, have they announced like when roughly when they're trying to release it by? Or? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, I well, think that at this point they're they're just at the beginning of the you know the green light process. It's still okay. it takes years to make an animated film. Yeah, well, we'll be we'll be looking out for it. Well, good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because oh gosh, I remember hearing rumors like you know back when Nickelodeon or Paramount were picking it up and they had a scene with King Doc or something and. And yeah. then that whole ordeal got pulled off the table. So, yeah, it was. It's it's been a long road. Yeah, uh, well, but it's it, but this this time is uh, I like the people involved and what the heck. Good, yeah. very good. And then, um, so yeah, and then your current project is Razzle, correct? Or, right. Yeah. So can you? I mean, I haven't had the opportunity to pick it up, but I I mean, I hear nothing but praise for it. So uh, what's that all about? Well, um, I recently got. Um, I kind of I got yelled at by the the guys that run Comic Book Resources, the website, because I didn't have a. They couldn't describe it very quickly, so I. So <laughs> I, this is here's the quick pitch version of what Rassel is. Uh-huh. It's Jason Bourne meets Inception. Oh. It's it's a uh, it's sort of like um. The idea is it's this, it's this guy who we meet who's an art thief and he's got some kind of equipment that allows him to. Uh, step across the divide into parallel universes uh-huh. and he'll steal things for, and bring them back and sell them to like, you know, rich people in China and Las Vegas. <laughs> right. Uh, but then as it, but then it turns out it's a, it's a very kind of a claustrophobic noir hard boiled story with a lot oh, of cool. very current, uh, hard science in it. I mean, a lot of the science he, that he's using is, is real stuff that I've gleaned from string theory and uh, M theory and stuff like that. Okay, and is it a? I mean, is it kind of like a darker storyline? Yes, it's it's not it's not like a. 
I mean, Bone was sort of like uh, I was doing a, an Uncle Scrooge comic for adults. Right. Uh, and, and it has actually become a kid's book now. Which yeah. boggles my mind. But uh, <laughs> I didn't write it for kids originally. And Arassel is, is actually is like a dark noir murder mystery type of comic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you're uh, – there's always a clear distinction of um, your drawing, you know, and like mm-hmm. – I mean, the characters are always kind of, I don't know, they, like, I would say they're kind of, like, rounded and, like, soft, but I've, I've seen the color for Razzle, and it looks, like, very shadowy and, you know, kind of yeah. mysterious. Yeah, so, my, my friend Terry Moore, who um, does his book Echo, and um, what's his new book? I'm blanking on it. <laughs> but um, Rachel Rising. But he, uh, he, 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 his quote was my favorite one. Where he says, "It's so strange seeing a Jeff Smith drawing doing dirty things." <laughs> <laughs> no, that's. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's certainly. Uh, you know, that happens with with actors and all kinds of entertainment. You know, when they cr- they jump ships, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how long? Um, how long is Razzle supposed to make a run for? Is it kind of an ongoing or? It's about, it's going to be about a four and a half year project. And I'm, I've been working on it for almost four years now. Right. So, uh, and like bone, I serialized it first and I'm slowly collecting it. And, uh, the story is set to wrap up in like the next two issues. Oh, wow. I have a, well, I have a third issue that I have an issue in the pipeline right now. So there's like three more issues total. Uh huh. Um, and it's getting a little tight. I might have to add some extra pages to the last one. <laughs> yeah, well, there's. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can. It's a special event, right? <laughs> right, right. So, um, okay, well, that's certainly surprising. Um, so that actually gives me a new question. Uh, what? Uh, I mean, what? What will you do once that's all said and done? Well, I've got an idea for another story, and it, it of course, it's completely different than Bone and Rassel. <laughs> oh, okay, but I don't have a name for it yet, so. Yeah. Um, I'm still kind of putting all the pieces together. Although it, Rassel has no humor in it at all. Really? Uh, other, other than irony. Um, okay. But uh, I'm going to, whatever I do next is definitely going to go back towards humor because uh, that's a lot of fun to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. And then, um, oh, shoot. <laughs> I, I blanked out. Um, <laughs> hmm. Oh, darn. Okay. I'm just going to leave you hanging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, it'll be cool. Or, yeah, so do you prefer, um, right, I mean, writing your own characters then? Because I know you did you did Shazam for a little bit, and that's all I can really think of. So, I mean, you know. That was it. I mean, I've done, uh, well, the, I did, the only time I've ever worked on a character that wasn't my own was Shazam. Yeah. And I did that because, um, well, DC called me, and they wanted to know if I'd would work on Shazam, and that's uh-huh. that is the single character that does appeal to me for a number of reasons. One, he's he's one of the original comic book yeah. creations. I mean, he he's his roots go straight back to you know like 1940, the uh-huh. golden age, and he hasn't changed that much. Like most of the other characters, to to people in your listening audience that have you know that follow comics at all, know that over the last you know 15, 20 years characters have all gotten revamps and updated and they're a lot more grown up they're darker and violent and but not captain marvel and so yeah i thought that was fun that he had not been changed and i didn't want to change him i wanted to actually keep him you know mm-hmm. straight up golden age comic boy <laughs> yeah yeah i really it that did show and it was like it's kind of a breath of fresh air amongst you know everything else that's going on all the time i mean i kind of i kind of put down you know all the the major comic books because it's so hard to keep up with you know spider-man's doing this but captain america's doing that you know yeah and see, that was actually one of that's interesting that you say that because the the part of the selling strategy for most comic books because you got to remember they're corporations they're corporately yeah owned and controlled characters mm-hmm. and, you know so they have they have corporate strategies, commercial strategies, to intertwine all the books to get you to buy them all. And yeah. Take, I just think and you, all yeah, that you takes, want them all. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it kind of takes the fun out of it a little bit. I mean, yeah. it, it takes a specialness out of it when, you know, uh, the couple characters might cross paths. So that was one of my conditions when um, we were negotiating, DC and I, over whether or not I would do this Shazam comic. I was like, I... I 
want to be completely standalone. I don't want to have to worry about what Superman is doing or Batman. As far as I'm concerned, Captain Marvel and Billy Botson, they're the only superheroes that exist. Cool. <laughs> and they were like, cool, fine. Yeah, and, and it's a nice little run, you know. It's like four issues, and they're all they're all kind of they have a harder cover to them, you know. Like, yeah. I think they're a nice little collection piece that you know stand out amongst all the other dozens of comic oh, books. Thanks, there. <laughs> well, yeah, no problem. I mean, it's just like my honest opinion and stuff. I mean, it's uh, I mean that's why I turn to stuff like you know The Walking Dead and Scott Pilgrim because it's just like here's some characters and you know they're fun to read and I don't have to go searching for it you know it's just this is their story yeah, and that's yeah. how it is i agree yeah very cool um well the you know the 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 superheroes are the engine for the field i work in i mean i i used to read them a lot when i was a kid i don't want to i don't want to put them down or anything and there's when they're good they're good um but the real the the innovative stuff comes really from the indie side uh, you just mentioned Scott Pilgrim, The Walking Dead. Yeah, I mean that's those. I mean those are the big books right now. Yes, um, they're the ones that kind of uh, open new doors that uh, help you know push the boundaries back, get new readers in. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, you, I don't think comics could exist without one or the other. You got to have the indie guys and you got to have the the mainstream guys because yeah. they they kind of. They kind of feed each other or help each other survive. Yeah, for sure. It's it's hard to like. Uh, I mean, a lot of comic books get compared to, or like you know, that's the problem is people are, end up comparing everything to itself. But I, you know, the indies are so different from everything else that's going on. There's not really many indie superheroes, you know. And, and that's uh, just fine, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I know. In my writing class, like I had to be the guy who pitched his superhero script and my teacher's like, well, that's fine. But you know, you got to make sure that these guys aren't being compared to, you know, Iron Man and Watchmen and stuff. And I was like, Oh, that's going to be difficult. Like, (laughs) but I look forward to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, just when it comes to, yeah, it definitely seems that you're, you know, deeply involved with, uh, just kind of like your own writing and, you know, not, you don't really fret the, what the major guys are up to and stuff, but um, no, 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 I can't keep up with that. <laughs> yeah, they, no, that's fair enough. I they mean, keep, they, they, uh, didn't they just redo do a new Batman number one, new Superman number one? I can't. Yeah, the uh, fifty, the fifty two, where they made, event, yeah, yeah they they started fifty two superheroes over again. Yeah, no, for me, I want to know what Craig Thompson's doing with Habibi. I yeah. want to know what uh, you know. I, I mean, my interest goes, I you know straight back through the indie kind of innovators, you know, right back to uh, Art Spiegelman, Robert Crumb, Mm -hmm. Art Kurtzman, Will Eisner. I mean, those are all guys. None of them did superhero comics, you know. They all Uh do all kinds of different things, you know. Some of them are humor. Some of them are about sex. Some of them are about life in in the tenement in in New York City. I mean, it's just the the indie guys are the ones who uh, excite me um, yeah, because they're telling stories. Uh, you know, they're they're writing like they're actual novelists. It's their vision. They write it. They draw it. It's mm-hmm. about something they're interested in. I mean, I mean, superhero guys are interested in superheroes, but oh, they're yeah. but they're working. You know, they're working for a living. They're working for uh, a company yeah. that's you know assigning an editor, who's assigning a writer, who's assigning a yeah. Uh, an artist and an inker and, and it's a it's a factory yeah and you don't have to worry about the continuity as much you know because i would never want to have to write spider-man because he you know there's so many people who've had their run on spider-man you know exactly exactly and in fact when they asked me if i wanted to do shazam uh before they said shazam they just mentioned the possibility of me just doing any kind of superhero comic because I don't think they were sure I would be. And had they uh-huh. offered me, you know, anything, you know, Superman or Batman, I wouldn't have done it because they've been done yeah, pretty well. I mean, I don't know <laughs> what I could say about Superman. Yeah, that's sort of the appeal of, like, but, the Ultimate series is that, um, yeah. you know, they, they're they're on their own, sort of. Yeah. But you you were about to make another point. Nah, I think that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, I mean, yeah. Who are? What are you kind of? Do you read stuff currently, or? 
Yeah, right now on my bedstand, I'm I'm reading a lot of the reprints of some of older comics. There's we're in a golden age for people that love comics. Yeah, because you can get complete runs of everything from Peanuts and Dick Tracy mm-hmm. to uh, right now I'm reading um, the old Floyd Gottfriedson Mickey Mouse strips from the 30s. Oh wow. And they're actually pretty good. You wouldn't recognize Mickey Mouse at all, man. He's a little, <laughs> kind of a little scrappy. No, well, that's that's a silly, that's a corny word. But he's a, no, he's I, kind of a little. He's not. He's not a schmuck. He's like a he's like a little guy who'll get in a fight and go steal stuff. It and he's sounds awesome. like a 1930s mindset for comics. <laughs> he and, was awesome. <laughs> and even um. I think Bone came out in like one complete hardcover recently, right? Or yes, the whole the whole thing in uh, color. Yeah, for yeah. the first time. Yeah, because yeah. I bought the I bought the one volume, and then the color ones are coming out. So I was like, oh well, <laughs> I collected about half of them. But then, um, yeah, I mean, do you prefer it in color? Or well, uh, I my vision in the beginning was to have a, a large you know, 1,300-page black-and-white book, and that's what we ended yeah, up with. That is so that, so yeah, that, it's like So that right big chunking paperback is, that's my baby. That's the thing I really wanted. But once uh, Scholastic wanted to, you know, repackage re-release them, it. re-release them to an entirely different audience, uh, a different market, you know, kids and schools and stuff and libraries, uh, and we decided to color it, I learned very quickly that, and and I worked on the color with we we did the color here in in in, in Columbus, Ohio. I have Steve Hammaker works with me, who did the color, uh, and he did a fantastic job. And kids love it. People love the color. And I gotta admit, by the time we were done coloring, and it took five years just to color. Oh wow! Um, I think the color's better. It's very enjoyable. I don't love it the way I love the black and white because it's it's emotionally important to me, you know. But the, uh-huh. but the color is it's better, man. It's it's a it's a really shocking improvement. <laughs> uh-huh. That's good to hear. Like that you're open minded to that stuff as well. You know, um, some people would not be game to change anything about what they put out. Yeah, and I can definitely understand that. Um, you know the with the one volume being what you set out to do, I, I would be attached to it too, certainly. Yeah, and the Scholastic very generously allowed me to keep the black and white one volume in print. That's actually still, you know, on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble, and it's a um, it's published by my wife and I, Cartoon Books. That's not Scholastic. Okay. So uh, they just. They just said, "Hey, you can have your cake and eat it too." Oh, all right. Yeah. What does what does Cartoon Books do exactly? Well, we're a publishing house that my wife and I uh, started up just to publish my comics. Okay. Uh, and she, you know, runs the day to day operation. We publish. We still publish Bone. We publish the one volume edition of Bone. We license the color to uh-huh. Scholastic to okay. publish, and we license. Um, the color bone all over the world. It's like in 23 languages. Right. Uh, we also publish, you know, my current project, Rassel. Yeah. Um, and that's a pretty full-time job. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> I mean, with uh, I mean, if you sit in a meeting, it doesn't sound like comics. It sounds like you know, hey, we got, we're looking, where's this wire transfer from, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, the Norwegian publisher or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of. I mean, yeah, there's Evil Inc. who puts out the Amory Wars and Kill Audio and Key of Z, which Key of Z is like a, co- a zombie comic that's kind of breaking ground right now. And, I mean, that's just, you know, a guy and his wife, too, the the singer of Coed and Cambria. And, um, I mean, it does sound like a full, a pretty, uh, you know, sounds like it's a lot of work. And a, all yeah, well it's, well, it's a real, I mean, it's a real business. You have to, you uh-huh. have to kind of separate the cartooning from the, from the, from the money, you know, yeah. I mean, you got to have the money to, to do the cartooning, so you can't just blow it off. Mm-hmm. And um, having a partner as good and as trusted as the one I have, the right. it's it really helps. And we have a, it's a full time operation. We have uh, 
besides the J and, uh, and myself, there's three full-time employees, and so and they all have different specialities. You know, uh-huh. Steve Hammaker helps me with art, and Kathleen Glosen works on, with the J to run the office, and we have yeah. Tom who does all the internet stuff and goes to shows. And uh-huh. yeah, it's not it's not uh, just sitting around getting ink on your fingers. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh... Yeah, I do. I I have to thank Kathleen for being so helpful in uh, setting up the interview here that's happening right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, when you guys come up with a new, this this just keeps leading to more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, if you <laughs> if you when you have a new idea in mind, do you uh, do you guys have to take it to like a larger publisher, or is Razzle kind of your own thing that you put out yourself? No, or? no. It's uh, the idea is to publish it myself. I mean that, but that does mean we have to come up with our own strategies for. Uh, releasing it and publicizing it and, and that kind of stuff, which we've kind of honed over the years. Um, this is our 21st year in business as cartoon books. Right. So we're, we, we're pretty used to the circuit. We know we have a lot of, we know a lot of people in every state and every country. And, um, you know, though we like to publish it ourselves uh-huh. first, uh, and then we would, we'll, then we take it to like, there's like to f- the Frankfurt book fair where all the publishers in the world meet and we'll you know we'll have meetings and see who wants to publish it in other languages wow yeah well congratulations <laughs> oh, thanks, man. and um yeah so i mean if other like authors ever approached you guys or like how do like well a little bit in the early days but we didn't um that was never our goal you know we weren't trying to become you know a, a big company right we, we were just trying to you know publish my books and <laughs> not go bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's that on a lot the, of people's menu. That was the goal. Yeah, it wasn't always easy. We came close a couple times. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there's close calls everywhere. Um, all right. Yeah. So I mean, uh, for the listeners out there who are, you know, uh, you know, the kind of writers and dreamers and stuff. I mean, do you have any hints or tips on how they should go about getting their stuff put out there? Or? Well, you know, besides just, you know, just making sure you draw and, and write. I mean, you got to start with the comic. You've yeah. got to make a whole comic okay. before you can get any reaction from anybody. And it's a lot harder to sit down and start in the you know, upper left-hand corner and go through, <laughs> go through a, you know, a 22-page story or something. There's, you'll learn a lot about yourself if you just make yourself do that. But beyond that, you know, just like getting in the industry. Um, uh-huh. I think the smartest thing is to uh, start communicating with other people, other cartoonists who are trying to get into the industry or who are in, you know, an entry level, a couple steps above you. You know, and I would I would suggest going online, uh-huh. going to web comic sites, finding these kind of communities, and figuring out who's doing the kind of comics that you like and you want to do, and figure out how they're selling it. And I would also go to a, like a local regional small press show there's tons of indie shows everywhere i mean we have them in columbus um huh. they're in chicago they're in toronto there's a huge uh small press or like an indie show in uh, toronto coming up in may that i'm actually going to uh, called tcaf okay so google that uh, so that's what i would say i'd say get into find out find the people that are trying to do it uh, right about just above your entry level and start right. uh, start figuring out what they're doing. Yeah, uh, do you that's have, what I did. I mean, that's yeah. what I did. <laughs> yeah. Do you have plans to go to uh, the Chicago um, Comic and Entertainment Expo, C2E2? Yeah, not this year. Not, not this, this year, year. But I, I went, uh, I think, last year or the year before. I can't remember. Pro- probably the year before because I, I was there last year. Okay. So. And, and, I didn't, and I don't remember seeing you, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I mean, I'm, it's, it's a fun time. That was the first time I went to, like, an American comic book convention. And it's, I mean, it's not the size of San Diego or anything, so it's manageable to get yeah. around. But it's big, um, man. some of these shows are big. Uh, San Diego is one hundred thirty thousand. Yeah, it's. I was just scary. in uh, Tuscany in northern Italy. There's a little town near Pisa called Luca. It's a little medieval city with a wall around it and everything. Of course, it's more modern when you get out <laughs> the suburbs. But the center of it is still very, very medieval. It looks like Michelangelo. You could shoot a Michelangelo movie there and not change much. Oh wow. Um, but 150,000 comic book fans descend on this thing once oh, wow. a year. Huh. A huge show, and it's, it's fantastic. So, there's a, yeah, there's a very thriving culture of comics. Everything from cosplay to 
um, uh, critique clubs and reading clubs. And I, there, I, I, if you want to get into this business, you need to, to to explore that kind of stuff. You need to find magazines about it, online sites, and read about it, and just learn, you know, who are the movers and shakers? How how are things done? How are people doing it? Okay. I'm saying that because I'm thinking, you know, you're a university radio channel, and I'm trying to remember the kind of things I was thinking when I was yeah. at university and trying to crack, <laughs> trying to crack it. How do I crack this comic book biz? Yeah, we've uh, we put trial and error through, you know, talking to people about, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, you know, and uh, it's it, and I try and encourage other people, you know, to just there's people out there doing what you want to do, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's like it's really not that hard to get involved in all that stuff. But, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure it's exactly the same in the indie rock scene or anything uh-huh. like that. Yeah, for sure. All right, so um, yeah, I guess that uh, kind of covers all the bases. Is there anything? Uh, you I think I add? think you did a good job there, Robbie. <laughs> I think we covered everything. Yeah, man. thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for being on. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll keep in touch and, you know, see more out of you in the coming years. You got it. All right. Thanks, Jeff.